Welcome to A Fostered Life, the show in which we explore the various facets of foster care through the voices of the many people who participate in the system. I'm your host, Christy Tennant Crispin, and this is Episode 3. In 1988, a group of DSHS social workers grew tired of seeing the deprivation often faced by children in foster care. They started purchasing the little things needed to help children feel loved and capable, things like birthday presents and school supplies, funded by community bake sales and car washes. Well, that little band of dedicated social workers evolved into what is known today in the state of Washington as Treehouse, an organization that helps more than 7,000 youth in foster care each year. Offering programs that focus on academic success, fulfilling key material needs, and providing the important childhood experiences every child deserves are the focus of this organization, and in 2012, Treehouse embarked on a bold and ambitious goal to address the alarmingly high high school dropout rate among youth in foster care. Treehouse has acquired a track record of success in helping youth in foster care thrive, and today it's my pleasure to be speaking with two of Treehouse's finest team members, launch success coach Alex Cornell and PR specialist Jesse Coleman. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I am really grateful to be talking today with Jesse and Alex, who are both from uh, Treehouse. And I'm mostly speaking with Alex, but I very well might bring you in on it at some point, Jesse. So I'm just getting that out there at the front of it. Um, So can you start by telling me a little bit about what Treehouse does? And um, I would love to hear you share how you got involved with this work, specifically serving uh, youth in foster care. Sure. Uh, Treehouse's main focus, um, it's become twofold now, is to help youth graduate high school with a plan for their future. So we have a program called Graduation Success, and that's a program that starts working with youth in sixth grade and follows them throughout their um, high school career. So they will be assigned a um, education specialist. We have over, I think, 80, oh, sorry, we have, we have over 100. 1,300. Uh, we have uh, 1,300 youth on a given day in foster care. Oh, no. Oh, sorry, within Treehouse that we serve. So the ed specialists each get a caselet of youth. So say um, they're in inner Seattle, there will be one ed specialist assigned to those um, youth. And what they do is they meet with those youth every single week. And the cool part about what Treehouse does is so many of these youth in foster care, they have all these providers, right, pulling them. They pull them out of class. They have to go to the, you know, meet them at their office and do stuff different like meetings. And so Treehouse actually comes to the school every single week. And as as you know, and one of the most important things for youth in foster care is really consistency. Like mm-hmm. growing up in foster care, there's no consistency, right? So Treehouse is an organization and definitely within our different programs are really big about showing up for the youth at the same time every week. And so this way it gives the youth the ability to know when we're coming, know what to expect, um, and to be able to be prepared with like questions they have for us. So the main goal is to help them graduate high school, but we're more than that. I feel like at times, so I recently did the job as an education specialist. I've been at Trails for five years, and I, um, I'm i currently um, moving into a new role, but I have I was an education specialist for five years. And so it's really great. You are like part parent, part social worker, part cheerleader, part, part anything that these youth need. And so it's really exciting. We go in and we create what is called student center planning goals with these youth. And then we create things called action plans. So I really like to explain it that a student center planning goal is kind of at the top of the stairs, and an action plan is everything that gets you to that goal. So our youth have goals from being professional athletes to uh, maybe getting an A in math quarter that quarter to getting on the softball team. And so we really just work with the youth um, regarding their academic goals mostly, but also their goals just in life in general. So... um, It can really vary what we're doing. We have a very holistic approach, which really drew me to Treehouse. So we work with the foster parents, or as we call them, the caregivers, and we work with the school as well. We work with outside providers. We work with um, independent living people. And so the youth is really supported on all different sides, and we're just one of the spokes within that wheel that kind of keeps them them going and helping them, like, get to where they want to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't echo strongly enough how important having some consistent presence is when almost everything else is inconsistent and unpredictable. So that's quite a gift that um, that you're giving. Alex, I'm really curious what led you into this role? Um, how did you get involved with, yeah, what drew you to do this instead of some other career? <laughs> Yeah, so um, so that's a very interesting question. Um, I actually grew up in the foster care system uh, in Washington State. I grew up in 17 different foster homes, and I was adopted when I was 12. That my adoptive family was, uh, I think they maybe got into it for the wrong reasons. Like you had stated earlier, I think they had this grandiose idea that it was going to be excuse me, easy, and they were going to help out, and it was just kind of this hands-off approach, and they could just put me in counseling, and it would be fine. And so um, I was raised with the same foster family um, from when I was 12 until I graduated high school, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life, and so I knew I was going to have to pay for everything. Back then, there was no treehouse, so um, I'm 43, so back then, there was no one that's like, here, here's your financial aid, and this is how you can get into school, and I had soccer scholarships all over the country, but I didn't know how to fill out paperwork or to, to, to accept them or who I would talk to, and so I went off with my life and moved uh Seattle for a little bit, and then Portland, Oregon, and I actually didn't go to college till my 30s, and so I went to college and got my undergrad and graduate degrees in criminology and criminal justice with a focus on conflict resolution, which I have come to find out that was probably the smartest thing I could do because I've used that specialization more than I have um, Mm -hmm. anything else, and so I was visiting uh, one year uh, my brother and sister-in-law, and I was kind of unhappy with Portland, and my brother also grew up in the system, and his wife said, oh, have you heard of this organization called Treehouse? And I was like, no, well, like, what's this Treehouse thing, right? Like, you know, I'm thinking a Treehouse. Right. And so she, she pulled up the job application and was like, this is what you get to do. And I had never thought, I, like, I always said, I never want to be a social worker. Like, I'm going to want to adopt all the kids. And I said, I never want to be a cop because I have my own moral compass about what I can tolerate and can't tolerate. Mm-hmm. But I saw this job and I was like, oh, my God. It was like... It was just this kind of like lightning bolt, and I thought, oh, I can I can help kids the way that my you know first grade teacher Miss Mulhern helped me, or I can help kids like Mr. Macuso, who was my PE teacher that got me into track and field. And I thought, what an amazing opportunity! And I really live by this motto that if you've been blessed, you should bless up. Mm-hmm. And it was in that moment where I was like, okay, this is my calling. Like this is this is what I need to do. Like I can give back and. You know, I very wholeheartedly believe that um, you can't teach someone how to do this job. Like, all my colleagues are of the utmost integrity and standard, and and they are just the most genuine people I've ever met. And the majority of them have not grown up in the system, but the thing is, is they have a heart for the work. And so um, I interviewed with Treehouse, and here we are um, five years later, and I'm still doing what I love, and I believe wholeheartedly in our mission and the way we support our youth and the way that we teach them about self-advocacy and growth. And um, recently, last year, we started a new program called Launch Success, which I thought it was great you used the word launch. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what the Launch Success program does is – uh, the launch success coaches uh, will now work with youth from 18 to 26. So we really saw a need that – as you know, when you're 18, you're not an adult. I mean, I probably no. wasn't an adult until I was 30, let's be honest. And so <laughs> we started this program now where, and so I was, to be honest, I was kind of, I was getting burnt out. Like, as you can imagine, it was, it had become very emotionally taxing for me to sit in rooms and have to tell kids that caregivers didn't want them anymore, to sit in rooms and um, uh, with kids that are in the hospital for you know, suicidal ideations or kids that are struggling with, like, it was very much like I was reliving my childhood. Yes. And so I was really blessed that Treehouse, you know, this is the second per, second year program, but so launch success is exactly what it sounds like. We want to launch them su- successfully into an adulthood. So we really focus on housing, education, and career, because those really are the big points Mm -hmm. that we know our youth need to be, like, really focused on to actually succeed and have a living wage. And, you know, we don't push just four-year college. We're into trade schools and two-year colleges and four-year colleges and apprenticeships. And if if a youth wants to join the military, like, whatever their dream is, like, in the Launch Success Program, I now get the opportunity to now work with these young adults that are – 
at a different phase in their life. Yeah. And I'm very much, a, I think because I grew up in the system, I have a little more clout when I can say, you know, you, you got to get it together. Like you need, you know, you need, if you know better now, which means you need to do better now. And so right. I have really very honest real life conversations with these kids. Like I care about them all deeply, but I also know that I didn't get to where I am without someone really challenging me when I kept making the same decision over and over again, or someone that like really was gently, like gently would steer me in one direction several times. And until it got to the point where they're like, okay, Alex, like this is now your choice. Like you now need to decide whether you want to succeed or fail. Yeah. So I'm super excited. Super, super excited about the new program. I'm excited about, not, you know, having done the other job for five years, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to be a launch success coach because, like, I know the youth in the programs. I know the schools they went to. I know the ed specialists that they work with. I know, you know, their wraparound teams. And so I just think it's a really amazing opportunity, and I think it was really, you know, and we had, the Treehouse had started talking about this when I first started five years ago about this program and is, is there a need and what can we do and what does that look like? And so I think that we've done so well as an organization to help our youth now uh, graduate high school yeah. that we are now ready to add a different component um, component to what what we do. And so when I first started Treehouse, the youth that were in foster care in Washington State were graduating at uh, 80% less rate than their peers that were, quote, unquote, in traditional families, right? Wait, and say so that we again, created 80% a- less. So, like, take all of the kids, typical kids who are going to graduate, and, and 80 per, like only 20% of those kids who are in foster care are going to graduate. Right. So, sorry. So, thirty. So, the number is thirty-six percent less rate than their peers. So, thirty-six okay. percent of all the youth in foster care were graduating at a less rate than their peers. Gotcha. So, our goal was to actually. If I can just jump in and clarify that, it's yeah, yeah. Less than thirty-six percent of kids in foster care in King County were graduating from high school, as compared to the peers at the time, which were gradu- graduating at seventy-one percent. Okay. Gotcha. And that was in 2010. Okay. That's why Jesse's helpful. Yes. No, it's always good to have your numbers guy on, on the side. <laughs> I'm the emotional person. He's got all this stuff. So yeah. now our youth in foster care graduate at? Uh, a five-year rate of 82%, realizing that uh, because kids in foster care are so mobile, that that extra year is really needed to get to the finish line. But we're going to yeah. stick by them either way. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, that's a huge increase in how oh your house is helped. Helps our youth in Washington State. Equal, yeah. It's equal to the state graduation rate. Yeah, that's in, that's incredible. That is incredible. Um, I want to just pause if you if we could, because I'd love to revisit a couple aspects of the conversation. Um, the first is just kind of something that I have learned over and over again, and you've you've touched on it several times, is that. Um, when we just when we just kind of from a distance hear statistics about youth in foster care, maybe it's a person who's not involved at all in the system, has no experience, and they're maybe reading a newspaper article and they're, you know, somewhere in the story about somebody, it mentions oh this person was in foster care. And there's, as we know, a higher level of kids who are in foster care who are incarcerated or um whose outcomes are just like exponentially worse than kids who are never in foster care. Um, But it's too easy to gloss over those and not take a moment to go upstream or go back to their backstory and talk about all the places along the way where um, moment after moment, um, incident after incident, youth in foster care are incredibly disadvantaged by the time they get to high school. And I can speak from my experience, you know, you take a five-year-old who enters the system and who at five years old is, is starting kindergarten. And now again, I'm going to make some generalizations and I can say that I, we've also had five-year-olds in other kids in foster care for whom this wasn't the case, but I'm just going to kind of, you know, give an example of, of a child who comes into care, doesn't know numbers and letters, does, has never, doesn't have verbal skills, has, um, been, um, hasn't kind of gotten a lot of the early start, head start type stuff. And then they are suddenly placed in a strange family and they begin the 
trauma of being taken from the only family they've ever known and going into the system. And then maybe years of shuffling schools because they've moved around. I believe you said you had 17 different homes while you were in care. Um, And yeah, we had one of the women that I interviewed, um, previously for this podcast, she shared that she was in 13 different elementary schools. Um, We have one son who in the first year we had him, he was in three schools. And that was, you know, again, through no fault of his own. Um, He joined us midway through the school year. We lived two hours away from where he had been in school. So it was impossible to keep him in school. But just watching all of the disruptions in kindergarten that sent him back. So he repeated and, you know, I think that was really good for him. We called it a redo. He got to redo kindergarten where he didn't have to change schools three times. And, you know, but then you kind of move along to disruptions, kids maybe going back home, which, you know, is the goal, reunification, but they maybe have to leave the school that they had been in in foster care. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. So um, by the time high school happens, um, and even with, you know, our, our daughter, um, she had, she's in high school and she had to move a bunch and she didn't know from week to week necessarily where she would be. And how, how is she supposed to focus on her studies when she's like, not even sure where she's going to be at night? I think people just don't understand all of the up story, backstory things that happen that we then expect a kid to show up to high school or to get to high school and be able to handle like all of the high school stuff. And I mean, I can tell you there's no, I had a great upbringing. There's nothing that would send me back to high school. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to that, you know? So I think it's just really worth mentioning that like, um, we're asking so much of these kids and to, and to know that there's an organization that is recognizing that and going, you know what, we cannot do this. We cannot do this. They need something and we're going to step up and provide it. Um, and also to something that you said, Alex, I mean, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head that you have a unique authority to speak to kids because you have lived through it. I do struggle sometimes with, um, how hard I can push, how, you know, uh, how, I don't know the right word to say it, but just how much to push, um, kids that we've had in care because I don't know what it's like for them. I don't know what they're going through. And I know things that they need to do in order to get themselves to a different place and things that ultimately, as you said, they have to choose for themselves. But how do you motivate a kid, motivate a young person who maybe is feeling like the whole world is against them and life is super unfair and how do you kind of push them to start going advocating for themselves and, and making those choices that only they can make? How, how do I push them within the current job that I have? Or yeah. And I mean, even just if you're thinking about an audience of, Oh, you know, I would even say just like, how would you advise a foster parent? Um, I think I'd have a, a couple different ways. So as a foster parent, um, I think the, best thing a foster parent can do is be humble. I think the most effective way when you want to push, push, or let's say motivate, it's a much more positive. That's a great word. Yes. Uh, Let's change that. (laughs) When we want to motivate, when we want to want to motivate a young person is for those foster parents out there, I would just say, be humble and like ask curious questions, like really lean in and, and at the, at the very beginning, like acknowledge, like, Hey, you know what, Sarah, like, I know that you have all this other stuff that's happened to you in your life. And I know that I can never imagine the things that you have gone through or the way these different things affect you. But, you know, when, when me or say there's another partner, you know, when we say these things to you, it's because we see this like untapped potential. We see this, like the greatness that you can be. And when we kind of push, it's not because we're trying to be hard on you, but it's because we see how all the greatness in you and we want to help you see that too. And I think really for foster parents, that like, I never had my foster parents say that or my adoptive parents. And I, I think now that that would, that would be so powerful, right. To just acknowledge, I don't know the life you lived and I, I cannot imagine that life, but I am here and we are here to support you. And whatever that looks like, 
from us, like let us know what works or what doesn't work or, you know, and let us know when we push too hard or push in a way that doesn't feel good to you. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would, that's what I would, that's the advice I would give um, foster parents. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's different. Each youth is different. Some are harder. Some are, you know, I'm 43 years old and I like, I still struggle with, am I good enough? You know, I got the word tattoo, I got the word extraordinary tattooed on my arm because, you know, when you go from place to place to place to place, you just get start to, like, I'm obviously not good enough. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And so, you know, you don't just stop being a foster parent when that kid leaves or when that kid's 32. Like, as an adult, I, my whole life, like, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Like, am I doing my job? Well, you know, it's, 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 there, there are things that no matter and I won't really want the foster parents that are listening to your podcast here. This is like, no matter what you do, there will be things inside your youth. There will be in, things inside that child that will probably be there forever. It's just a matter of, can you help quiet that voice? Can you help change the narrative a little bit? Can you help spin it differently? But there, there has to be an exception that, and I think this was the issue with my adoptive mom, is like, you can't fix me. Like, A, I don't need to be fixed, and B, to be honest, like, I didn't ever trust my adoptive family, and that and that is very uniquely me, but because after 17 foster homes, like, yeah. I thought everyone was going to leave, and so yeah. I just really think for the foster parents, just, like, just accepting the fact that there are stories they might never tell you, there yeah. are things you might never know, there are pains so deep that they might never tell anyone, and just really honoring the fact that, like, that is what makes them feel safe. That secret, that pain that they're not going to share, like that's their thing alone. It's the thing that no one else can touch. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, been one of the things that I've really been pushing a lot is um, for foster parents to really become students of, of psychology and especially ACEs and kind of trauma. And um, because I do feel like um, if you go into this, without a lot of that knowledge and background, um, even just having read a couple of books, you know, even just a few resources that kind of highlight how trauma affects people and how it gets so deep into who you are and, you know, um, and to not take things personally. I think that's really hard for a lot of foster parents to not take personally um, and react as if it's in a personal attack um, when things happen, but to rather go, this is something I need to, you know, th- yes, they're screaming at me and, you know, calling me names or whatever. I need to not take this personally. I need to actually, like you said earlier, lean in with them and recognize that they're, what they're experiencing, it, it, it in a lot of ways, doesn't have a lot to do with me. Now, foster parents yep. can certainly contribute <laughs> their own brand of trauma. But I mean, you know, um, I think that this is just really important for foster parents to get. And I think, I, I know that there's a lot of change right now in both like the adoption world. I know there's a lot of um, a, an emerging uh, body of work that is representative of the voices of adoptees. And I think that's incredibly important. But I think for too long, those voices weren't heard. So all we had were um, maybe therapists and, um, you know, the dominant voices were like the foster parents or the adoptive parents or whatever. And um, I think that we didn't really realize how much of what was happening inside of our kids. And um, and so I'm, I'm grateful that a lot of that is coming out. And part of what I'm hoping will happen here is that we can really get people to recognize this and do the hard, heavy lifting of learning um, about how these things affect our children so that we can, so that we can do better by them and support them and heal what can be healed. And then just sort of be with with them in what can't be healed and recognize, you know, it's not about us. We need to be able to um, just sit with them in their pain and, and, uh, you know, whenever it comes up. Um, So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think you also, you know, you've mentioned twice your age. I'm a year older than you. I'm 44. And I, I spoke with one one of the other people that I spoke with on this podcast. She too mentioned, and she's about our age also. She too mentioned that when she went to college, she had no idea what was available oh, yeah. to her as a youth and foster nope. care. And so that's another thing is maneuvering, watching someone who maybe has not had a parent teaching them things like how to fill out forms and maybe the, you know, I mean, I'm trying to think of different examples, but I had a a, 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 a
Yes. So yes. that's something that all of our education specialists and law successes coaches do. Every single youth in foster care that we serve, we help them fill out their FAFSA. We help them fill out scholarship information. We pay for college applications. We get them to interviews if they need be. Like That is an amazing thing that Treehouse does is we pay for all of that stuff. Or no youth leaving foster care or no youth that are, is currently served by Treehouse has to worry about that. We help them do all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Because those forms... For me, at the age of 44, having done this kind of thing before, I find it daunting. I can't imagine how somebody would just sort of sit down to this paperwork and go, I don't even know where to begin, you know? Um, and you also, you also, okay, another um, aspect, another, I would say, injustice of foster care or for kids in foster care is things like um, uh, getting driver's license and um I never knew until we had a teenager that Treehouse helps kids get their driver's license when they're yeah, in I was care. just going to say that. We help them get their license. We pay for their driver's ed. Um, if they need enhanced license, say they are getting a job, like where they drive a forklift, we pay for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We do all incredible. of that. That's incredible. What? Um, so uh, Treehouse didn't start out this. What, what did Treehouse start out doing? What was the initial work of Treehouse? Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, okay. in, 1980, in 1988, we were founded by a group of social workers that saw this disparity within the foster care system. And um, they just really grew tired of not having the resources and always having to say no. Um, and so they started to have car washes, uh, have bake sales. Um, to fund the little things like uh, birthday parties, um, getting school supplies, uh, getting new clothes for the first day of school. And, and it evolves from there um, into uh, two of our, our uh, two of our programs. One is called uh, the Treehouse Store, which youth can come in and shop at. Um, and the other is Just-In-Time Funding, which helps pay for um, extracurricular activities, uh, things as simple as haircuts. Um, and then we also, at the time, uh, started a tutoring program. And um, uh, we started asking the state, we wanted to know what our impact was. And so um, our leaders at the time started asking the state for uh, data on our graduation rates. And um, that was the number we were referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, that report finally came out in 2010 um, about the King County Youth and Foster Care graduation rate um, mm -hmm. being uh, less than 36%. Um, and so uh, Treehouse was, you know, our leadership at the time, they shed a few tears and then they got to work uh, and they started doing research and they learned about uh, check and connect. They learned about student-centered planning um, and they created uh, what is now the graduation success model and set a goal for themselves that by 2017 they would raise um, that high school graduation rate for youth in foster care in King County to the same rate as their peers. Um, and uh, we ended up exceeding that goal uh, mm -hmm. with the five-year gradu extended graduation rate. Mm -hmm. And so um, over the years, we started to notice, uh, over those graduation success years, we started to notice more and more barriers that we needed to address. And one of those, um, we worked closely with a partner organization called the Mockingbird Society, and they brought up the, the issue of mobility and not having access to um, transportation, and so uh, we uh, partnered with them to advocate for the state um, to uh, to fund this program uh, that is now driver's assistance. And then we, um, uh, like Alex was saying, we started we recently started Launch Success um, to address this uh, this huge need that we were hearing from our alumni, um, as as well as a need that we've seen for a while now. Uh, to address that transition into adulthood. Yeah, yeah. And so now we've set a goal to expand the graduation success program statewide by 2022. Uh, and uh, along with the graduation success program, uh, the launch success program will follow. Wow. So Treehouse is in, I have been to Treehouse several times, a number of times, and um, it's in King County, it's in Seattle, but you're saying statewide. So does Treehouse now have like um, satellites across the state? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we we aren't able to ex 
expand our um, our like free house store into those communities. But luckily, there are um, community partners out there that we're reaching out to and that are already doing this work. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just helping them, partnering with them to get the word out there. Um, and uh, but graduation success, uh, they work in the schools. So like Alex can tell you, she was working in schools in Renton across Renton. Mm -hmm. So um, we partnership, we partner with school districts, uh, work in their office. We also have a program called Ed Advocacy, and that's been around for a while. Um, they do more like triage. I would call it triage, like when students are in crisis, uh, they step in, figure out what um, what their legal rights might be within the school system, making sure that they can stay in the same schools, uh, and they're serving K through 12, and they're statewide already in there. Uh, working within the DCYF um, offices. Gotcha, gotcha. And in terms of helping youth stay in the same school, because I know that was a big deal for our daughter, um, we actually don't, we live outside the city of Seattle, um, but she was allowed to stay in Seattle schools. So that, you know, that was great, but she has a long commute each morning, but they, um, but they are making that possible for her. Um, uh, how do they do that, though? I mean, do they work with trying to find foster families that are in district? How does that work, trying to keep kids in the school, so, in the same school? If a youth starts, um, say the youth is placed in your home, and they start going to school in the neighborhood school that you're close to, and then they move out in the middle of the year, they are still able to go to that school for the rest of the year. And often they can petition the district the following year as well to keep going to that school. We often talk about like the social capital they have, the resources they have, mm -hmm. uh, the like relationship that, ships that they've built. But yeah, if a youth switches in the middle of the school year, um, I had a youth that was going to Renton and his foster family was in Puyallup. And so it was a pretty early commute every single morning, but that is their right that they yeah. can stay at that same school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, that one of the panels that I was on a couple years ago, um, a woman, I was there as a foster parent and she was there as a former foster youth. And she was, yeah, she was just making the case that, and this was something that I had not thought about, just it didn't come to mind for me. But when kids are taken from their family, they're, it's not just that they leave the only family they've known, they also will leave their school a lot of times. And that's like even more of a community for some kids than their family was, um, it, depending on the circumstances. And so I, I just never thought of it the same way again. And now I'm super advocate for helping kids stay in their rooms, you know, in their school, um, if at all possible, because I've seen how the investment of teachers and counselors at school and, you know, principals, the, the, they love their kids. They really do. And, um, a lot of times they're even more devoted to the kids they know are going through hard times. So, um, you know, I would love to um, spend the last little bit, well, I want to give you a chance if there's more that you want to share about the work you're doing or kind of what you're doing, but I would love to also ask you to um, share sort of what you think the maybe three or four um, biggest hindrances are for kids' success beyond the instability. I mean, um, well, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, just what you think kind of the, are the biggest challenges and how um, outside of a systemic approach I, or organizational approach, how the individual foster family can support um, their youth beyond keeping a humble approach and just recognizing, you know, I don't know what you've gone through. Um, um, but also, how can a culture as a society um, be more supportive? I mean, I'll give you an example of one thing that came to my mind is encouraging people who have businesses to intentionally try to hire foster youth or former foster youth. Um, just, you know, to be intentional about posting job opportunities in places that cater to foster youth um, to try to, you know, be in intentional about giving them opportunities for employment. What are some of the things that we as a culture and the individual foster family can do to support our kids? Yeah, that's a big and a very broad question. Um, so I think that, I mean, the first thing I would always say to support the youth in general is to just listen. Uh, I think that's the, the, the really the main thing is to listen to what they're saying, what they're not saying, um, what they're needing. I feel that, as you stated, uh, we also 
uh, have several connections here at Treehouse where we can often help our youth get jobs. Um, I also think changing the narrative that a youth in foster care, especially an older youth, is like broken and comes with all these other problems and, you know, is kind of a harder youth to have rather than a younger youth. I think really changing their perspective of what people um, think and believe a youth in foster care looks like. Uh, you know, our youth, I think people have an idea of what these kids look like and how they show up in places. And a lot of the youth in foster care, they show up as any other youth um, in a classroom, you know, and unless you know their story, then you don't know uh, what they need. And so I think as a community, we can, we just really need to be aware of uh, just, I mean, currently right now in in Washington, 7,000 youth in foster care are served by Treehouse. And we're at about 1,300 youth within our graduation program. But statewide, 10,000 youth across the state, um, which is a little less than half a million um, nationwide, 10,000 youth across the state um, are in foster care at any given time. And so I feel like people are at a brighter, you know, I always think about like celebrities or athletes, right, that have this certain cause and this certain kind of box they stand on. And I always wish that someone would stand on the box and talk about youth and foster care. You know, I wish someone would stand up there on a, I mean, if I could stand on a corner for eight hours a day and talk about youth and foster care and the, like the programs and what happens and where these youth can end up, um, I would. But I think that for some reason, I don't know if this is like the dirty secret across the nation, but like no one really wants to acknowledge that these youth have been like putting foster care for no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the thing that we can do as a community is keep, you know, I was really surprised when I moved to Washington and I would be like, oh, I work for this nonprofit and I would say Treehouse and everyone would be like, oh, I know Treehouse. Mm -hmm. Like I want every state to have a Treehouse. I want every state, every major city to be like, or something similar, right? But for them to be like, oh yeah, Treehouse, like, Oh yeah, and to, I mean, if we if every state did what we do, can you imagine the numbers that would change? Yeah, yeah. And I think you know when when you asked about how would I get a youth to be motivated, right? And and, and I'm going to be real, and this and this is what I say to, to to almost all my youth, some of them in a more direct way, but you know. I would say, like, if you want to if you wanna give so-and-so the middle finger, if you're mad at your mom or whoever gave you up for adoption or whoever put you in care, I would say to them, the biggest way to do that is to succeed. Yeah. Go be what no one thought you could be. Go yeah. do what no one said you could do. Yeah. Like, walk with your head high. Like, yeah. no one knows your story. And I tell them, like... At the end of the day, if you can look at your mirror, look at yourself in the mirror and know you acted with integrity, then you did the right thing. Yeah. You know, and I say, like, you have to know your own truth. Like, people are going to have stories about you and think they know you. And, you know, I just, I, I try to motivate them because, like, that's what I had to do. Like, I had to be like, whatever. Like, you know what? Fine. I'm going to go do what I, you said I couldn't do. And yeah. I think for a lot of our youth, that's, like, very, very motivating. Like, oh, okay. Like, because there's, there's an anger in every youth that's in care. You know, there's some sort of, like, burning anger that wants to prove every single person wrong. And so, A, I think as a community, we need to do um, a lot better about just acknowledging and really trying to understand the epidemic that is youth in foster care. Like, this is a very, very scary thing. You know, and you have the statistics of, you know, n nationwide, like, you know, one in three experience early pregnancy, one in four experience the criminal justice system, one in three, you know, experience an episode of homelessness, you know, about eight billion academic disparity, early pregnancy, criminal justice system, that's all part of the issue. And it's like, yeah. we can do all we can as foster parents, right, as a foster parent, but are we addressing the systematic, systemic issues that are causing these youth go, to go into care? Right. And I think that I think that is the major like the bigger issue. You know, but what can you do in your own home as a foster parent? Like be humble. Admit that you don't know their life. Admit that like you need help. Like help me understand how that feels to you or help me understand why this is like ca causes you to feel anxiety. You know, it's but I think at the end of the day, this needs to be a topic that, you know, I'm always like, I'm going to write Ellen a letter. I need to tell yes. Ellen that she's kind of like, you know, but I feel like there needs to be some, and that's really sad, right? But I feel like unless we can put a treehouse in every single city, like right now, 
then like I need someone big that's going to stand up and and take this platform and talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. The closest I've seen to that anytime recently was the the movie that came out last year, um, instant family. I'm sure that's totally on your radar. Um, but that, that was the first time I saw foster care in a mainstream Hollywood, you know, raising awareness. And while it was a Hollywood film and it was, from my perspective, I went to, I actually reviewed it for Vox and I, um, I, I felt like for a Hollywood film, it touched on foster care realities in a way that very, like a Hallmark Hall of Fame movie wouldn't, you know, um, it was still, yeah, yeah, they didn't get into the nitty gritty as much as, but they, but they talked about like how hard it was for teens and, you know, Tig Notaro's character in that film, uh, you know, gave some statistics and stuff without kind of coming off preachy. And I, I don't know. I just, but, but I'm with you. I'm like, let's sound the bell. Let's ring the bell and let's like, let the world know it's, it's, uh, this, this needs to matter to everyone. This needs to matter to everyone. Yeah. And why doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know. I'm with you. I'm going to bring my box and stand next to you on the street. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. also a show on, um, I believe it's through Netflix called the fosters and it's actually oh, yeah. about a lesbian. Uh, yeah. Right. So, and that's also a really, you know, that was the first show I saw where I was like, Oh, like, Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, I just think that, you know, and if the thing is, is if it takes me eight hours a day, two days a week standing on a corner, then that's what I'll do. And I think that I just, it's why when Jesse or anyone in marketing or anyone at Trails is like, can you speak to this group or that group? I'm always like, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Like, I will always lend my voice to this cause. And I will always lend my, like, this is, this is what drives me every day is so someone doesn't have to experience what I experienced or other youth experience. You know, my thing is like, I want every single youth that I work with to know undoubtedly that there's one person that they can count on, that there is no matter if they go their whole life and never feel loved or supported, that there was one person at one point in their life that meant that they knew would take care of things. Yeah. 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 I I love it. I'm so with you. I'm so grateful for the work you guys do. Our family has, you know, and children who've come and gone from our home have benefited um, from the work that you all do. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we live in a place that has treehouse. So, um, yeah, well, I appreciate so much, um, what you've shared today and just the perspective and the challenge that you're issuing. Um, as we close, I know that you all serve, you serve the, the, King County and you're, you're in Washington for people who are listening to this, who are outside of that place, how would you recommend someone listening go about trying to figure out how they could help in their own communities systemically or otherwise? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, like people call their local DCYF or local DHS or whatever and say, Hey, I want to help. What can I do? Yeah, I mean, a, a, a simple Google search can find organizations. There's organizations across the country that are doing uh, good work. Um, you know, really uh, look for for organizations that are outcome driven, um, like Treehouse, that are that are focusing uh, not necessarily all on being reactive. And if there they aren't, if there are organizations that aren't there yet. Um, you know, lend your support and help them get there. Uh, you know, just find a way to get involved. And I encourage everybody to to come visit um, our 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 site, uh, our website at treehouseforkids.org, and you know, follow our blog and stay up to date because um, you know it, our goal is Washington State this year, but who knows where or by 2022? But who knows what will happen with us outside of that um, once we reach that goal. We're yeah. also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Like, it, it, we just post really powerful stories, and we have a little, uh, a lot of powerful youth that speak and lend their voices to helping other, you know, other youth in their same their same circumstances. Yeah. I love it. Um, I love, Alex, how your story, um, which could have had a very different outcome statistically, data, you know, according to data, you are 
absolutely um, like using your story as a fuel and as the very kind of driver behind all of the good that you're doing. And, um, and while nobody would choose the past that you've had for you, I mean, I tell my daughter all the time, I, I would give anything to go back and change the things that she's had to go through, but they have given her this incredible fire. And, and it sounds like it's yep. given you this incredible fire to make a difference for others. And I just admire you so much. And I'm so, so impressed and grateful for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate that. And I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to, just wanted to say in closing that, you know, when I was in my twenties, I had this very, and maybe this will help your daughter or other foster parents listening that this very like, why me, why me? And then one day I was, I was running and I was like, well, why not me? And ever since that moment, I changed the whole perspective of my life, right? So I stopped being the martyr, and I stopped asking why me. And instead, I was like, okay, this, th- this, is, this is my share of the world's pain to carry, and why not me? Like, mm. I, am, I was built to, to carry this, and I can do this. And I think I just really encourage foster parents or, and to have those conversations. Like, well, why not you? Like, mm you are able to hand, handle this, you can do this, and, and just never give up on the fact that they, they can be bigger than their, their circumstances. I think that's really important. Like, you can be bigger than the circumstances that you're in. Yeah, yeah, so powerful. For the record, I will say my teenager has been the easiest of all of the children we've had. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's awesome, and she totally, we were, we were not we weren't even licensed for kids over 12 and it was a a case worker we had worked with for a previous child we had who had left our home in December. And, uh, we had said, we're taking a long break. We have three adopted children through the system. We said, we're taking, um, we're taking a long break. And six weeks later, she called me, she said, we've got this awesome girl. And, uh, I said, okay, well, you know, let's give it a try. And we updated our license and she's been the most unexpected, wonderful gift to our family. And so I, I think that's part of why I want to sound this bell is that I, I believed the stigmas. I was terrified of having a teenager. I I was terrified of one of my, of when my own kids become teenagers, you know, (laughs) and, um, and I, having her has just been like, wow, one delightful surprise after another at how beautifully she has, you know, um, shown grace to me. And I've said to her, like, I need grace from you as much as you might need it for me at times. We need to have grace for each other. So, um, so I'm, um, yeah, I just appreciate all you're doing. And, and that message that you said, um, you know, to kind of flip that script and say, instead of why me, why not me? And how can this be the best thing I can do in the world? And, uh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, um, Jesse, uh, and Alex, thank you both so much for your time today and for, uh, the information and just encouragement that you're giving and for everyone who is listening and interested in knowing more, um, you can track them down on treehouseforkids.org. Um, you can find them, I think the contact information, but also just the information that is out there from Treehouse. It's wonderful across the board. But yeah, if you're listening and you're in another state, uh, just go on Google and start connecting with your local foster care support organizations. You could become a tutor. You could become an advocate. You could um, befriend a youth in foster care and be someone who just is consistent and steady in their lives. What a difference it would make. Um, uh, What a difference. Thanks again so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to a Fostered Life podcast. For more information and resources for foster parents, please visit afosteredlife.com where you'll find blog posts, YouTube videos, and social media links so you can connect with others on the foster parenting journey. If you're interested in supporting my work at A Fostered Life, please go to afosteredlife.com and click on the tab, Support My Work. This will take you to my Patreon page where you can become a patron. Just $1 a month helps offset the cost of producing these resources and enables me to offer them freely to new and prospective foster parents. And I'm grateful for the support of my patrons. Thanks for listening and thanks for caring about foster care.